Hello everyone, I, Dr. V.C. Manoj, on behalf of National Neontology Forum India and Learn From the Legends, thank you all for joining us today. Hearty welcome to this last session of this year, 2023, the fourth year of Learn From the Legends International Neontology Webinar Series. We have today a very interesting discussion on one of the most mysterious vital parameter of a neonate, blood pressure. And we have a legend in this field who has published a very interesting paper recently on blood pressure trends and phenotypes in neonates, 
to deliver today's lecture. Professor Yasser El Sayed from University of Manitoba, Canada. Hearty welcome, Dr. Yasser. And the moderator, moderators for today are very, two very good friends of mine, Dr. Mamta Jaju, Professor of Pediatrics from Delhi, India, and Brigadier Dr. Karthik Ram Mohan, Consultant Neonatologist from Indian Army. Welcome, both of you. Thank you. Now, friends, before I hand over the platform to our moderators, here are a few housekeeping announcements. The chat box on your screen is primarily meant for housekeeping announcements and greeting each other. Kindly type your questions uh, for discussion at the end of this lecture in the Q&A box and not here in the chat box. And uh, our next session after today will be in the new year 2024. So this is the last session of this year. The first session for the next year will be on 1st of February 2024 on a very common topic which we have discussed so many times, but we are looking at the recent concepts. BPD, what's new in early postnatal care to prevent prevention of BPD by Professor Huang Shang, University of Pennsylvania, USA. So please continue to join us next year as well. Thank you so much. Now over to you, Dr. Mamta and Dr. Karthik to introduce the speaker and initiate the session today. Thank you so much, Dr. Manoj. Good evening, everyone. So today, as Dr. Manoj said, we are going to have a talk on very interesting topic. So we know that when we are treating with the sick neonates, how important it is to take blood pressure. But we are always in dilemma that what to do with the blood pressure norms because of the many other things not available with us. So with a very interesting topic that what is normal blood pressure in neonate, recent insights into BP trends and phenotypes, I request our other moderator to please introduce our today's speaker, Professor Yasser. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I am privileged to speak about the speaker. Today's speaker is Dr. Yasir El Sayed. He is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Manitoba, where he is a staff neonatologist, a registered ecocardiologist, and researcher at the Children's Hospital Research Institute of Manitoba. He is an academic fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of Canada. He has a very long CV. He founded and directed the Integrated Hemodynamics Program and Point of Care Ultrasound there. He has conducted more than 100 workshops, workshops in the last seven years at various forums. His research papers are in the field of hemodynamics, point of care ultrasound, and physiology-oriented practice, in which he has published more than 100 articles in various journals, books, and abstracts. He is editor of multiple international journals and has authored 10 institutional Canadian Pediatric Society and American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines. He has founded the first internationally recognized websites, pocuneo.org and neopeds.academy, dedicated to virtual education in medicine and physiologic based practice, which website has over 8,000 members. He is the designer and director of Manitoba's neonatal educational curriculum of the Learning Management Digital System, LMS. Importantly, he is the founder of the Lung Ultrasound Program and has actually replaced chest X-ray for diagnosing lung diseases and founded the first training program for respiratory therapists to perform lung ultrasound. He founded the Intelligent Monitoring in NICU by near infrared spectroscopy and has trained staff in the clinical applications. He has founded the clinical decision support artificial intelligence to help decision making and design many clinical calculators. Dr. Yasir is a recipient of the 2023 Emerging Lead in Unitology Award 
from the Canadian Pediatric Society, as well as a 2023 Ronald Duhamel Innovation Award. And his most recent award is Emerging Academic Leader Award from Pediatric Chairs of Canada. We look eagerly look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. And uh, thank you again for the invitation. It's a great honor to me uh, to present in this uh, wonderful great platform. And um, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are all over the world. Um, just uh, for the sake of time, let me share the screen and start the presentation. Uh, so today, as uh, the uh, wonderful colleagues, moderators, mentioned about uh, the importance of blood pressure as one of the impor most important um, vital sign that we uh, use every day for stable and also for sick neonates. So the topic today, what is the normal blood pressure uh, in units? And I will be talking about the trends and phenotype. So now we are going be far beyond the simple definition that we have used for a very long time, blood pressure equal to residual age. We are not using that for 10 years. So if you are still using this definition, I hope after this presentation, we'll stop using uh, this simple one because it's non-physiologic and also not evidence-based. I hope everyone can see the first slide. Yes, we can see the slide, Doctor. Okay, wonderful. So um, I have nothing to disclose in this presentation and uh, I have four main objectives today or four main answers of four important questions. First question to be answered, what is the physiologic value of the blood pressure? So just to go back to the very basic question. Uh, then what are the phenotypes of blood pressure trends? So we'll come to know the blood pressure trends and uh, if the blood pressure trends uh, outside the normative values, then we should consider to treat. And after that, I will just uh, go over uh, quickly wha what mitigation we should select to treat. Then what are the normative values of blood pressure during postnatal transition, which is very critical period because during that period, the IVH develops and that might develop because of fluctuation of the blood pressure. And then the last question, what is the physiologic definition of hypotensive shock based on the normative value? So what is the dilemma of the blood pressure? Why it is really a, a, a big uh, issue for all of the anatologists? It's still a question not yet clearly answered to a lot of our, uh, to a lot of our colleagues. A lot of studies, and I'll just take an example, a lot, a lot of studies done to define the blood pressure threshold to treat. So uh, what are the threshold to consider shock and to treat? One of them, this very interesting study done in US, 16 centers participated in this study, and they try to uh, 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 compare between 15 definitions uh, of low blood pressure. So they tried first to define the low blood pressure or hypotensive shock. And in the study, uh, the question was not answered. Anti-hypotensive therapy administration was not associated with improved in hospital outcomes for any of the 15 definitions of low blood pressure investigated alternative methods. So now we are asking, we should look for alternative method uh, deciding who to treat um, and uh, like uh, we need to also uh, avoid or you know, minimize harm of using this medication. So the conclusion from this study for the 15 definitions of low blood pressure investigated, interestingly, um, the therapy as anti-hypotensive anti therapy was only prescribed to 3 to 50%, very wide range among the 16 centers. 3 to 50% of infants was low blood pressure. And paradoxically, the blood the anti-hypotensive therapy administrated to almost 30 to 40% of infants without the blood pressure as as per the predefined criteria they, they selected. So what's the problem now? Why they did not find, and there's not only one this study, a lot of other studies. 
So the the problem is they, they try to define the hypo tension or low blood pressure without even defining what's the normal blood pressure. That was really very interesting. So they did not uh, pay too much attention to define the normative value, which is really uh, uh, difficult. And I will let you know why. We stayed almost five, six years to try to define the normative value in premature infant. But I have to clarify first, we should not consider hypotension as a disease. It is not a disease. It is a marker of compromised blood flow. And it is bare autoregulation might be compensated or might be not. So hypotension might happen with many physiologic phenotypes. It's not just one, one number or one uh, criteria, which is uh, simplified in a lot of centers as blood pressure normalized as equal to gestational age or corrected gestational age. And the blood flow critically decreases when the blood pressure trends below the autoregulation threshold. So you may have blood pressure fluctuate within the autoregulation, and that should be considered as normal. We should not intervene with that. So what is the physiologic value of the blood pressure? So we need to understand the physiology of the blood pressure. And just I will, if you ask me what's the blood pressure, I will maybe define it as simply, it is bumping a volume against resistance, making a pressure gradient moving the blood forward. So that's the value of the blood pressure. The blood pressure is a gradient, gradient. So it is higher at the heart, higher than the aorta, and then the aorta higher than the arterioles, higher than the venules, and then back to the heart. So this pressure gradient propagate the blood from the heart back to the heart again uh, in the circulation. So we have now, it is bumping of volume against resistance. And just to go back to the physiology of the fetal circulation, there is two types of resistance that we need to understand. The, uh, in the right heart, the heart is facing the resistance of the pulmonary circulation, which is very high in the fetal uh, circulation. So in the fetus, we have the right ventricle uh, uh, facing high pressure. So resistance is high in the right side of the heart, and that should be decreased after birth when the lung is inflated, and the pressure should be decreased now uh, to the minimum pressure. It is opposite to the left heart. The left heart is facing very low pressure with the placenta circulation, because the placenta is the lung for the fetus, the organ of exchange. So in the, our body, we should have one circulation with high resistance, that's before birth is the, the high right side. And after birth, we have another circulation with high resistance, which is a, a systemic circulation. So after birth, now the lung is functioning and the lung uh, uh, should be at very low resistance and systemic should be high resistance. That might not really happen in a lot of babies uh, simply. So if the resistance uh, stayed high or uh, for the pulmonary side or did not increase enough in the systemic side, then we may have issues with the circulation. So that now to understand that the mean blood pressure is proportional to, not actually equal, flow and resistance. So based on the ratio between both, we understand the blood pressure variables. So for example, when you have significant decrease in resistance and slight increase in the flow, like try, the body might try to compensate, we may have the most common type of shock in our uh, uh, population, which is the vasodilatory shock or physiology when you have loss of resistance or vasoplegia of the arterioles, and you have the opposite, increased resistance and followed by a significant decrease in high myocardial performance because the heart uh, may not be able to contract against increased resistance. Then we have the vasoconstrictor physiology, which is less common, but we may have the disaster at the end, very low uh, systemic vascular resistance and very low blood flow, and is relate or advanced or cardiogenic advanced shock. We'll come to that later in more details, but now we need to know what are the blood pressure re reference values. Now we need to answer this question, the normal values. Before we define uh, or to know the hypotensive shock and when to treat hypotension, we need to know what's the normal. So we did the systematic review uh, in, uh, among um, our group here. So I was assigned to, to do the normative value for the Canadian Unital Network. Uh, so to have one blood pressure normative value among the Canadian uh, centers, and we did extensive review. And uh, as you can see here, like uh, unfortunately, we could not find any study 
to define normal blood pressure accurately based on the invasive versus non-invasive blood pressure measurement. But we found interestingly Zobro, which is the most the best designed article, although it was published 1996, but the design was perfect. Um, and I will tell you what's the limitation of that. And also we found a study which is really a uh, reasonable reference for uh, term infant. So Zobro is mainly for preterm infant and Alison Kent for uh, term infant. And we uh, added some modification to Zobro based on our data. And we use normative values for so many uh, years. Um, although we have to mention that the normative value based on non-invasive blood pressure values, they uh, evaluated what is strength of the study, the blood pressure for 90 days for all of the premature infants. And they dedicated only two investigators, two nurse practitioners, uh, we're working every day to measure the blood pressure twice with the same technique. So that was very strong study, but again, the limitation they used only uh, non-invasive method from the beginning. Um, although we are using, as you know, for sick infants for the first three, four uh, days of transition up to one week, sometimes arterial, uh, invasive arterial blood pressure. So we, um, uh, we use a study to develop uh, normative values with some modifications, and we included here the pulse pressure. So we have the systolic, the systolic mean, and the pulse pressure. We extracted that, and we modified based on some, our data, and we used that for many years, but that was not enough. So uh, we did another study, and this is the Allison Kent study for the term infant. So also we used the study for term, the infant were born uh, as term, for the first four days of life. And um, back to the dilemma of the blood pressure, now we understand that, uh, or if we ask this question, do we as neonatologists understand the blood pressure physiology and limitations? I will go over that because that's very important in more details. Do we have globally acceptable normative blood pressure values in preterm during different stages of post maturation? So the first three days of life, and based on invasive blood pressure values that we are usually using in very premature infants less than 28 weeks. And we need to know uh, uh, the limits then, which might be uh, might be a trigger uh, when the blood pressure fluctuates to induce IVH. So what is the physiology, uh, physiology of normal blood pressure? So let us answer this question clearly. So the blood pressure is diastolic blood pressure. That's a basic blood pressure or the baseline blood pressure. So diastolic blood pressure reflects two things, systemic vascular resistance and the blood volume. So it is uh, the pressure inside the container and the content of the, con inside the container, the blood and the resistance created by the uh, arterioles, mainly arterioles. The heart pump on top of this basic pressure to create pulse pressure not systolic pressure, which is mis un, uh, misunderstood uh, part with, among a lot of neonatologists. They may consider systolic blood pressure reflects the systolic performance of the heart. No, it is a pulse pressure, which is equal to heart performance and bump unction. And then pulse pressure plus diastolic equal to systolic pressure. So systolic pressure is independent, uh, is dependent variables, dependent on pulse and diastolic. And also mean blood pressure is two thirds the diastolic, one third systolic. So it is also dependent variables. So now we have two independent variables, the diastolic blood pressure and pulse pressure. So it makes sense when you look at the blood pressure, pay attention to diastolic pressure and pulse pressure more than other parameters. So what are the phenotypes based on that? So quickly, I will explain like three main phenotypes. We have other phenotypes, but uh, for the time, I'll just go over the three main phenotypes, phasodilatory, when you have low diastolic blood pressure and pulse pressure will stay normal. In phasodilatory shock, the pulse pressure may be normal and even may be wide pulse pressure in some situations. Systolic pressure will decrease because it is a sum of both. And then stroke volume might increase as for compensation, heart rate will increase and cardiac output might be a little bit high in phasodilatory shock. We'll see the heart might be hyperdynamic in this situation, as you can see here, but the calculated systemic vascular resistance expected to be low. And as you can see here, the trend is a trend of the arterial blood pressure monitoring. The trend is decreasing over time. 
and we maintain the pulse pressure. That's very important. So the red area here, which is maintained all over while the blood pressure is dropping, is the pulse pressure. So we have normal blood pulse pressure maintained. And just after we started the vasopressor, you can see the trend is increasing. And this is very common in septic shock, systemic inflammation, late onset shock, uh, medications like vasodilators, morphine, and with acidosis. The other type, was, which is vasoconstrictor, in this type, we had the diastolic blood pressure might increase, or at least to normal, and the heart might not contract well. And you'll see narrow pulse pressure. And because of narrow pulse pressure, you see low systolic pressure. Low stroke volume, heart rate will increase, but cardiac output is low, and high calculated systemic vascular resistance, normally between 150 to 250 uh, millimeter mercury per liter per kg per minute. So this is a normal value for systemic vascular resistance, and you can calculate it at the bedside uh, if you have the mean blood pressure and the cardiac output. The heart, as you can see here, globally is very weak, not contracting well. And you see here the pulse pressure is narrow. And if you look at the mean blood pressure here, it is normal. Or even above the low, uh, like the, um, the, uh, the median or the mean value, or you may see it even increased. The only thing detected here is a narrow pulse pressure, very narrow pulse pressure. So if you look at the mean blood pressure here, you will not detect what's going on. You will see only the infant deteriorated with lactic acidosis. So this is typically almost equivalent to systemic hypertension in adults. And after start of merinone or dobutamine, you see the pulse pressure widen, was normalized blood pressure and normalized hemodynamics. It can be commonly seen in failure of post transition adaptation in premature infant when the systemic vascular resistance increases after birth, the heart might not contract well against resistance. It might work well in term infant, but some preterm infant might not tolerate in sudden increase in resistance uh, during shift of fetal to postnatal circulation. post BD ligation syndrome, although we are not uh, doing surgical ligation anymore for so many years, or post ev malformation embolization, or in pulmonary hypertension, and some infant with HIE, because of cooling, might increase the vascular resistance and might induce vasoconstrictor physiology. And on top of that, you may have the heart performance is impaired in HIE. In some situations, septic shock, although it is rare in units, is more common in pediatric age group to see septic shock with vasoconstrictor CO. And the last type is very easy because you have everything low. Everything is bad and it, because it is really late. And I hope that you will not wait until you have this such late stage when the heart is very poorly contracting and failing because now the heart cannot contract against even normal resistance, and you see everything is low. Systolic, diastolic, narrow pulse pressure, so it is failing circulation now. And you need to use a strong medication like epinephrine uh, to support both the heart performance and the resistance. It is common in late uh, situation in low preload. If you are giving uh, dobutamine or dopamine on top of low preload, you may get worsening of shock. Failure of postnatal adaptation late, but no hypertension, also myocardial dysfunction. Mechanical ventilation was high in air pressure because of low venous return in this situation, progressive severe acidosis. Keep in mind if the, if the pH less than 7.2, then uh, the catecholamine means sensitivity expected to be low. So the body will not really uh, respond to either uh, circula circu circulated catecholamine means or uh, so catecholamine means as given medication. Or overdose of any troops, that's very common. If you give dopamine, dobutamine, and even if on top of that, very high dose, you will get the same effect. Cardiogenic shock was failing heart. So that's kind of iatrogenic. If you don't have invasive blood pressure, it's okay, no problem. You can use a non-invasive pressure, but very frequent. If the infant's unstable, you have to apply the cuff and then adjust the monitor to measure the in non-invasive pressure every 10 to 15 minutes and get the trend over time. So just to draw a line between all of these interrupted measurement and you can get an idea about the trend. As you can see, the trend is decreasing in this infant who is behaving with the vasodilatory shock. You can use, if you have the histograms in your own blood pressure monitor and the histogram will give you a very nice idea about the 24 hours 
trend of the blood pressure, if, especially if you are planning to wean the medication, you can adjust the time. You can make it four hours. You can make it eight hours. Any time from one hour to 24 hours, you can detect over the blood pressure trend for uh, diastolic and for systolic blood pressure and also for mean blood pressure. And you can understand how much time this infant spend below the fifth centile. So this infant here, the fifth centile for diastolic with 35 millimeter mercury. So we understand that 18% of the time, which is kind of significant time, this infant is not really ready for weaning yet because you have still 18% of the time below the fifth centile and also 14% of the time below the fifth centile for systolic, which is 50 millimeter mercury. So I have now conclusion number one in this presentation. Regardless of the normative table that you are using, the trend is very important. So don't worry about what, whatever table or whatever normative values are most important to look at the trend over time. And you have, you have more than 20% change of the trend from the baseline uh, to below the baseline by 20% or for more than 30 minutes. Don't keep watching that. This is seriously, you have to take action. So it is important to know the blood pressure trends in preterm infant during transition. It is really important. Um, uh, during transition is a period, critical period that IVH might happen. So uh, very early during the first six hours to 24, 36 hours, we may have the uh, blood pressure is low, which is really hypotensive stage, autoregulation is poor, and we may not have IVH developed yet, but once the blood pressure normalized and increased, we may see this IVH happened around second or third day of life when the autoregulation improved. So it is a reperfusion stage when the blood pressure is shooting up or increased. Not only the blood pressure, it also detected or more important to happen with sudden increase in the CO2, carbon dioxide. So we have the blood pressure uh, autoregulation curve here. So the y-axis here is a cerebral blood flow, which is not linearly uh, uh, following the blood pressure. So here you have the cerebral CO2, or you have the blood pressure values, which within this area here with the fluctuation will be the cerebral blood flow expected to be maintained. So if you have hypocarbia or hypercarbia within the autoregulation threshold, we are okay. Also hypotension or hypertension. But once the blood pressure decreased below the autoregulation threshold, you will see significant drop of the cerebral blood flow. And the opposite, when the blood pressure increases above the autoregulation threshold, you will see significant increase in cerebral blood flow. Here, the IVH happened. So the other problem, autoregulation is not expected to be uh, effective and mature in premature babies. So it's almost linear, almost linear, especially during the postnatal transition. It takes about two to three days to be a little bit more mature. And then it takes about uh, six months to reach the term value, which is close to one year. At one year is almost adult value. So the autoregulation is not really one type of autoregulation for everyone. It might be affected by a lot of things, especially the prematurity during postnatal transition. Now we'll come to this question. What is the impact of blood pressure and carbon dioxide on cerebral blood flow? Uh, we did this study, which not yet published. It is under view, but I'm showing the most important slide, which is very interesting uh, finding related to the relationship between I, uh, IVH and the changes in the blood pressure and carbon dioxide. So we have here um, uh, the mean blood pressure in purple color, and you have the carbon dioxide measured in uh, either the, by transcutaneous monitoring or by frequent blood gases every six hours. And then you have the mean blood pressure Sorry, we have the cerebral oxygen saturation by near field spectroscopy, which reflects cerebral blood flow, and you have the hemoglobin here. So you can see here where the blood pressure was okay, kind of low, but increased. And also, you have also in some patients the CO2 increased, and that was associated with sudden increase in the cerebral blood flow. And that was, detect was detected in the blood gases, a sudden drop of hemoglobin here. So the hemoglobin was 
used as a marker that we have to screen uh, for, uh, like followed by short period maximum second day of life or second day after drop of hemoglobin by cranial ultrasound. So cranial ultrasound confirmed IVH, but we detected or assumed assume the time that IVH developed by the drop of hemoglobin, which was exactly after the sudden increase in the CO2 and or the blood pressure. But we found that in most of the cases, it was actually CO2. So playing with the mechanical ventilation or weaning too much or doing a lot of changes during the transition is not really preferred in very premature babies because that might induce IVH. In other group with absent IVH, absent severe IVH, I'm talking about grade three and the higher IVH, the blood pressure was almost linear, increased gradually as per normative data, and the CO2, there is no significant fluctuation in the CO2, and the cerebral blood flow was uh, gradually increases without sudden increase uh, uh, secondary to any changes in the CO2 or blood pressure. And the hemoglobin was okay, just slightly increased because of blood sampling probably, so based on that, we realized that it is very important to know the normative blood values uh, in preterm infant during postnatal transition. That's the most critical period. And the blood pressure usually plateau after that. So after that's not a problem, but during this transition, it is very important to understand. It was, was not really easy study, and I will tell you why, because how we define the inclusion criteria, it, it is not really easy to define normal values for premature infant because premature infant to start with is not normal. The infant born very early, and there's a lot of issues might happen during transition. So to, to get a sample, we investigated uh, five years among close to 600 infant, and we only got 200 with normative value. And you will understand that if I go over the inclusion criteria, which is we excluded in born error, uh, sorry, uh, in born infant born at uh, outside the tertiary center. So only infant born, and stabilized within the tertiary center, did not receive any trans, uh, transfusion or volume expanders during the first 72 hours of life. Most of them, unfortunately, they received. Hemodiacally stable, did not receive any cardiovascular support during that period. Stable oxygenation and the FI2 did not exceed 50%, either invasive or non-invasive ventilation, did not receive nitric oxide. Not treated for hemodiacally significant PDA during the first three days of life no significant IVH grade three or preventricular hemorrhage, no early confirmed sepsis. So it is very really extensive and also for sure survived until the time of discharge. So you can understand now why it was really difficult for other centers to conduct a research on normative value in premature infant. It was really difficult and tough. And I dedicated one uh, investigator assigned to this program collecting blood pressure and other variables daily. So on the only his work is to collect data every day, full time work for five years. So over the, that period, we uh, succeeded and we collected the data. And as you can see here for the first 72 hours of life, there's a normative blood pressure values for infant. For example, I took example for 23 week or preterm infant, and all of them, you will see the uh, diastolic mean blood pressure and systolic blood pressure values increases gradually hour by hour up to seven, uh, 75 hours of life, and then plateau after that. And also in all of the premature infants started from 23 weeker up to 28 weeker, you can see the blood pressure gradually increases with increasing gestation age linearly. So we have now the normative trend and simply we can define now what is the abnormal value if, our, if the, any infant behaving was outside these normative values, uh, you have to be concerned about hemodynamic uh, instability. So we ex extracted the table, which is available published in the article, which is now easy uh, to follow. If you have the infant uh, lives in fifth centile and the trending down, then you have to take it seriously. And if you started medication and you now reach the blood pressure to 25th centile, then you can consider weaning or discontinuation of the medication. So that's really easy job to do now. And again, the most two important variables, diastolic blood pressure, and the pulse pressure, which is the systolic minus diastolic. Now, 
we have are on our track to define the shock. So we know if we know normal, now it is easy to understand what's abnormal, what's shock. We cannot do it the other way around. We cannot assume definition of shock or hypotensive shock without understanding what is the normative value. So the definition of hypotensive shock or cardiovascular compromise, at least one of the following. Number one, low one or more of the blood pressure values below fifth centile with decreasing trend. Significantly decreasing trend more than 20% below the baseline. Number three, borderline blood pressure parameters. Uh, the, and I, I, as I mentioned before, the most two important variable, the, the independent variable, the historic blood pressure and pulse pressure associated with oligoria or lactic acidosis. If you have borderline blood pressure, but we have oligoria or lactic acidosis not explained by anything else, then you have to treat it. Or low blood pressure with decreasing trend of the cerebral oxygen saturation if you are using near field spectroscopy to monitor the cerebral blood flow. Now we'll come to another question. What are the reference ranges of the basic hemodynamic values beyond the blood pressure? Again, blood pressure is one of the parameters uh, that we are relying on. But if you integrate to other parameters, which we call it in our unit, the integrated hemodynamics, then you will get much better, better view about hemodynamics. And we published that in this article, Integrated Evaluation of Hemodynamics, a novel approach for the assessment of management of preterm infant with compromised circulation. And you, as you can see here, we have uh, other names from expert in hemodynamics of North America. And we published the centile values for the perfusion index, cardiac output, fraction shortening, systemic vascular resistance. As I mentioned, it's very easy to calculate if you have cardiac output. And then the cerebral oxygen saturation uh, based on near-field spectroscopy and the fraction of oxygen extraction. And now I have this card or kind of... Uh, uh, memory card that you can keep in mind to remind you about the three types of shock, the vasodilatory shock, vasoconstrictive shock, and the cardiogenic shock. So if you have this trend, the blood pressure trend, as you can see here, uh, decreasing with maintained pulse pressure, systolic, diastolic mean they are decreasing, decreasing below the centile value in this term infant. Uh, this vasodilatory shock, we are using norepinephrine or vasopressin, plus minus fluids have indicated. We are not using dopamine in our unit for many years. Dopamine is a medication that might increase the pulmonary vascular resistance, reduce cardi uh, cardiac consumption of oxygen, and also might affect the oxygen consumption and the brain. So it is harsh and unspecific medication with a lot of side effects. But if you are dealing with phasodilatory shock, you can use a medication that's more specific. Uh, the same even in PICU and adults, they are not using dopamine anymore. So you have the phasodilatory shock, low diastolic and systolic with normal blood uh, pulse pressure, and this typical pattern of phasodilatory shock. You have the second pattern with the phasoconstrictor shock with normal diastolic or even increased above normal diastolic and narrow pulse pressure and pattern. Uh, this pattern can be treated with dobutamine or merinone and merinone mainly if you have RV dysfunction. And then when you have everything is low and compromised, that's cardiogenic advanced shock. And as I mentioned before, you can use epinephrine as a preferred medication for that. Um, you can also use this uh, app, which is uh, artificial intelligence app. It's called the C Clinical Decision Support System for Neonatal Hemodynamics. It's available on App Store. And uh, you can use it for uh, blood pressure centile values and also integrated with echocardiography, it can help you to calculate systemic vascular resistance and help you for weaning also the uh, phase of or, uh, if you are not really sure to wean or not. So you have the first page, the centile values, you have to select the gestation age and Asian hours. And if the infant's term uh, is the infant on cooling or not as HIE, because that will affect the numbers. And you have, uh, you have to enter the number and the calculator will let you know the centile values. And if you reach the 25 centile value, then you can consider weaning of the medication. These medications are very dangerous and you should wean as soon as the infant stabilized. And then it is integrated evaluation of hemodynamics with cardiac output. If you enter the cardiac output values, the calculator will calculate for you the systemic vascular resistance 
And also, if you enter other eco, these are just very basic eco parameters. You don't have to be super expert in echocardiography. You're just trained in neonatal hemodynamics. And you can get very good insight about what's going on. If you enter also the near field spectroscopy value, you will get an idea about oxygen delivery and the oxygen extraction. So it is full physiologic assessment of everything and can give you impression about what type of shock vasodilatory and what are the other causes that might be contributing and the intervention. Um, and now, what's the impact of relying uh, uh, on here, physiologic trends? Someone might ask me, okay, so now we have been following very simple uh, way of assessment, which is blood pressure equal to gestational age for so many years. So what's the impact of following this kind of more detailed physiologic trend? So simply, I can answer that we did that in our unit. Uh, after we started the integrated hemodynamics assessment of using the detailed blood pressure values with the table available at the bedside, at the bedside nurse, looking at these sidetile values every day or every shift to be sure that the infant, as part of the vital sign assessment for every infant admitted to NICU, and then integrate that to echocardiography and near field spectroscopy. Uh, so we did that for three years as Epoch 2 and compared to Epoch 1, which is before uh, implementing this uh, integrated hemodynamics assessment. And we did that for shock, for pulmonary hypertension, for PDA assessment. Um, so for PDA, we reduced the PDA ligation almost to zero and pulmonary hypertension significantly we really reduced the infants uh, that are failing uh, responsiveness to uh, inhaled nitric oxide or sildenafil or pulmonary vasodilators. And here I'm showing you the impact on shock. So we have 340 infant assessed for shock over uh, uh, almost five years period. So epoch one, before, integra before integrated evaluation of hemodynamics, the time to clinical recovery was almost 71 hours to get the infant stabilized. This time was almost half, half time to clinical recovery in Epoch 2 after implementation of integrated hemodynamics. It means that half time, half of the time uh, for the infant to be stabilized, more stable, for sure that would impact the brain development. And half of the time, uh, the infant exposed to the, these kind of dangerous medications. And for sure, also, this will impact the neural development. You have much less number of deaths but the study was not powered enough to evaluate mortality, but the trend of death is much lower. So now at the end of this presentation, I would like to uh, remind you about a few things. The two important independent variable for the blood pressure is the systolic blood pressure and pulse pressure. And then the systolic and the mean blood pressure are dependent calculated variables. So they are very important and more important during weaning. So if you started the medication, uh, norepinephrine or dobutamine for some time, and the infant now is stable, if the infant is stable, you can rely on one parameter like mean blood pressure, because now the infant is stable. So you can look at, look at the mean blood pressure, centile value, and you can wean based on that. But if you look at everything, that would be for sure better. Follow the centile values of blood pressure and other hemodynamic parameters. So look at everything to try to integrate as much as you can information when you treat for hemodynamic instability. The blood pressure trend is, uh, 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 is the most important reliable hemodynamic variable. The trend is the most important variable, which is, again, more than 20% for more than 30 minutes. Keep this number in your mind. If you have more than 20% below the baseline for more than half an hour, this is important to consider for management. Trend can be assessed as a graph trend or histogram. Don't just look at the blood pressure interrupted uh, as interrupted uh, time or any uh, random time. Uh, look at the trend over time. And the trend can be detected as a graph trend or histograms if you have a histogram integrated on your monitor. Uh, thank you very much. And I hope that we have enough time for questions.
So thank you so much, Professor Yasser. It's an excellent presentation and so informative because uh, till date, we are only using mean blood pressure for as per the gestation age of the baby to assess their shock level. But it's eye-opening to listen to your talk and the so informative that even like in Indian setting, we are usually using non-invasive way of monitoring the blood pressure. So it's very important to use the trains of the blood pressure to monitor them. And with the trains, we can uh, de-escalate our therapies. We can change our inotropes requirement. And your calculator must be very, very useful. I hope that we'll be all use this calculator to save our sick preterm neurons. So over to questions, I'll ask you. Sure. So the liver, yeah. Uh, so the, she says that it's an excellent presentation, but she want to know whether the perfusion in index is also related to mean arterial pressure. Yeah, that's a very good question. So um, the perfusion index, which is a number available on the pulse oximetry, and the, I'm not sure why the company they made the number really small. So it is usually uh, like uh, overlooked or the people, they usually ignore it. <laughs> but it is very important to look at it for many reasons. First, uh, the uh, oxygen saturation is perfusion dependent. So when you have the perfusion index less than certain number, which is 0 0.4 as defined by the company and by research, we should not rely on the oxygen saturation. So it means that the perfusion is poor and the number that you can see as pulse oximeter is not reliable. So it is between 0.4 to 2.2, we'll simplify it to three. If you have more than three, that might be a marker of uh, 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 hyperperfusion or uh, hyperdynamic circulation. It might be in detected in PDA, for example, or in phosphorylatory shock. When you have the number low or more important trend low it's also the trend keep the trend in your mind for everything it's not just below 0.4 is abnormal or more than three is abnormal the trend if the infant was 2.2 and now is 0.4 which is still normal it, this is abnormal because that's significant drop in the trend so it is signifying the preferred perfusion it is not related to central perfusion so we have to keep that in mind the central perfusion you need to get the blood pressure so the perfusion index is a marker to detect the peripheral perfusion. So it does not really, you, do, you should not reuse a perfusion index, for example, as a replacement of the blood pressure, because the blood pressure that's for central circulation. Oh. So you can use both to let you know an idea about the relationship between the central perfusion reflected on the blood pressure and the peripheral perfusion reflected on the perfusion index. For example, in HIE on cooling, you will see the trend of the perfusion index is getting low because the preferred perfusion is expected to be low and with cooling, but you see that you have to correlate that with the blood pressure because it, that's very important. The central perfusion, for example, for, for, for sure is more important. So it is helpful as a reflective of uh, peripheral perfusion expected to be low uh, in uh, phosphoconstrictor shock in, cool, in cooling or infant with hypothermia or infant of overall uh, poor circulation because you may have uh, central perfusion low and also peripheral low as well, low blood pressure and low preferred perfusion. So the most important to follow the trend and to correlate that with the central uh, perfusion reflected on the blood pressure. Thank you so much. I think it's very clear now. Uh, so Dr. Anil Kumar is asking that from what BP centile onwards, we should start tapering ion drops if acceptable urine output and lactate. How yeah. many hours should BP uh, BP should be stable before start tapering? Yeah, that's another very uh, good question. Okay, so usually once you once you start the phosphorus uh, or urinary tool for some time, it takes about six to eight hours usually in most of the cases, to get the infant stabilized. So I can't assume that you started norepinephrine and two, or one or two hours later, you stop it. That's not really practical and uh, not the case. I, I, we, we don't do that in our practice. Usually six to eight hours to get the infant stabilized between the 25th centile and 5th centile of the values. So don't win and if the blood pressure is still below the 25th centile because that's just borderline and just stabilized, with the effect of the phosphopressor that you are using. You have to get the blood pressure at, at least at the 25th centile 
and the plateau is stable for six to eight hours minimum. And then you can consider weaning as long as you have normal other parameters. Again, you have to look at the perfusion, urine output, improved lactic acidosis, um, and also if the infant, if you're treating cardiogenic shock or impaired cardiac performance, you can repeat the echo cardiography and assess the cardiac output as well. Unless you are treating phosphodilatory shock, phosphodilatory shock, you don't have to do echo because a normal pulse pressure reflects normal heart performance. I'm talking about phosphoconstructive physiology or impaired myocardial performance or cardiogenic shock. Echo is important, but phosphodilatory shock, you don't have to wait for echo or confirm that by echo. It is typically phosphoplegia, it is a peripheral circulation and the heart should be in, intact and working well. So there are many complimentary remarks for you that it's a very excellent talk. Then, Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Bharat is asking that what is the role of hydrocortisone in the management of early hypotension in preterm newborns? Yeah, that's another important question. You know, in the future, if we have a chance, we may de uh, dedicate a separate presentation talking about the physiologic management of shock, because I did not talk about that in details. I just uh, like uh, focus mainly on the normative values and the assessment of blood pressure. But typically, if you reach, if you started one medication and you are reaching the uh, medium dose of that medication, then you have to investigate. Usually, we send random cortisol level. If you don't have that ability, you can just give two milligram per kg of hydrocortisone. Uh, and if you see a response to that, it is an indicator that this infant. Uh, is uh, considered as a uh, supraranial dysfunction might be contributing to shock. So you have to continue with maintenance 0.5 milligram per kg Q six hours and keep it until you wean the phosphopressor. So don't wean it first, wean it at the end. Uh, so we usually investigate for any infant who is requiring, for example, if you start 0.05 of norepinephrine and now you escalated the dose and you are at 0.15, we maximum dose is 0.3. So it is a medium dose of, between the uh, the lowest and the high dose. If you reach that dose and still the blood pressure and issue, investigate for uh, subarenal dysfunction, either by giving a this dose of hydrocortisone or send a, cort a random uh, cortisol level. And also you can give until you get the level back. And keep in mind that random is random. You can get very high number, but if you test it in another few hours, you may get it lower. So don't assume that the random is fixed for days or long time. It just gives you a rough idea about the response of the suprarenal gland to the stress. So I advocate to use it if you are escalating the dose and there is no good response, as long as you are using the right medication. Right, Fazopressor, I mean. Yeah, I, I think that's very important because... Uh... If you are not using proper vasopressor or if you start using hydrocortisone, that it might create more problem to the baby, especially for the neurodevelopmental outcome. So we should be a little cautious, I think, when you are using the hydrocortisone. Yeah, that's yeah. very nice. So the next is uh, Dr. Jagadish Sahu. So, sir, can you please describe the memory card that you explained? What should be the target blood pressure when we should start being? Yes, uh, yeah, I, probably I mentioned that, but just repeat again. Uh, if you if you reach uh, the 25 centile of the value in the table, you can use a calculator. The calculator will help you. And we have that on our website, newbeats.academy, uh, because it's only a App Store. If you don't have uh, Apple phone, you may not be able to use it, but you can use it on our website. It's also available on newbeats.academy website, uh, mm -hmm. and you can use it from any computer or any cell phone. Uh, if you reach 25, uh, 25 uh, centile value, then you have to consider weaning as long as other uh, other parameters are fine, like uh, pass, passing urine, uh, uh, normalized lactic acidosis, um, and also no significant acidosis overall because you have to get at least the pH more than 7.2 uh, to get a good response of weaning. If the infant's still acidotic, it means that the, the might not respond well to weaning or might not respond at all to the catecholamines. In this situation, just to mention that uh, in, in severe acidosis, less than 7.2 uh, pH, and if you are, have 
significant issue to maintain the blood pressure or norepinephrine, we are using vasopressin because vasopressin might work on those low pH. So if you have issue with uh, getting the catecholamines, uh, maintaining the normal blood pressure, you can use vasopressin if you have it or terlipressin, whatever um, uh, like uh, generic name you have for uh, vasopressin, you can use that and uh, keep in mind that should not be used if the sodium is low less than 130. And uh, vasopressin used only in one line. So you should have a central line like double human and should be by a separate line because it's not compatible with other medications. Okay. That's very important. That's very informative also. So yeah. next question is from Tarek. So for hypertension in babies with congenital diaphragmatic hernia, what will be your approach? Well, uh, the, in babies with congenital diaphragmatic hernia, what will be your approach if the baby is having hypertension? Yes, that's a very important question. Again, I have a separate presentation on cardiovascular support or in congenital diaphragmatic hernia. So you need a dedicated presentation for, for that because it's not as simple as low blood pressure. You have also uh, 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 pulmonary hypertension, which might be resistant to... Um, uh, uh, resistant to pulmonary vasodilators, uh, you may have uh, combined systemic hypotension with pulmonary hypertension. And this situation is based on the echocardiography because we, we should do echocardiography to rule out significant pulmonary hypertension. If there is LV dysfunction, we use merinone or dobutamine uh, in this situation. Uh, if the blood pressure is low, because merinone might lower the blood pressure, we add more epinephrine. So sometimes we are using mix between merinone or dobutamine and norepinephrine if the blood pressure is low. If there is LV dysfunction or RV dysfunction, but with normal blood pressure, systemic blood pressure, we use only merinone or dobutamine plus inhaled nitric oxide for sure, or sildenafil if you don't have nitric oxide. So it is based on the type of shock. Simply go back to the phaso, is it vasodilatory? You can use only norepinephrine or phasopressin. We, uh, we prefer to use phosopressin because if there is element of pulmonary hypertension, phosopressin also will help in pulmonary hypertension. Uh, if you don't have, norepinephrine is also uh, a useful medication with pul high pulmonary vascular resistance. But don't use dopamine. That's the bottom line. Don't use dopamine in the phragmatic hernia because that might induce or increase pulmonary vascular resistance. Uh, if you have uh, the, any ventricular dysfunction, then use uh, do vitamin or merinone, either alone or with added norepinephrine if you have uh, associated with that systemic hypotension. And fluids for sure, if you have uh, um, uh, underfilling of the heart or any impression of hypovolemia, keep in mind the volume. It's very important to uh, use, to be sure that the tank is full before using the cardiovascular medications. I think so. That's a very important message that not to start dobutamine in cases because they might increase the pulmonary vascular risk. Exactly. So yeah. I think, yeah. So that's very important. So now we'll go to the next question that is Dr. Muhammad asking that how to follow the BP trends in an ICU and is there a special monitor to check the trend of blood pressure in an ICU? Thanks. Sorry, uh, how to follow the the BP trend in an ICU, and is yeah. there any special monitor to check for the trends? Yeah, so the blood pressure trends is two types, either invasive blood pressure and invasive for premature infant or infant who just born, we are using umbilical line, umbilical arterial line. And if the infant's sick and we cannot get umbilical line or infant beyond the postnatal transition, we are using radial line, okay. radial line for invasive blood pressure. I know that some units, they don't have the ability to monitor invasive blood pressure. Mm -hmm. um, it is um, like an, a big issue in a lot of um, uh, uh, middle income countries because it is like um, you need a, a, a one nurse dedicated at the bedside uh, and you need a good monitoring, you need uh, good antiseptic measures. Uh, if you don't have the ability for, uh, invasive, which is just the blood pressure connected to the monitor, and the monitor, the uh, the cardiorespiratory monitor should be able to detect that. You don't need a special monitor for that. If you don't have uh, the ability to monitor the blood pressure invasively, then you can apply the cuff method. And because it is not really accurate, 100% accurate, 
do it as a trend. So apply the cuff and you can adjust the monitor to measure it, uh, like will be automated measurement every 10 to 15 minutes. You don't have to do that manually every 10 minutes. That's too much uh, like uh, labor time. Just adjust the monitor and the monitor will, will make it every 10 to 15 minutes and get the trend. Only we are doing that frequent measurement of non-invisible pressure if the infant is unstable. If the infant is stable, you measure just once a shift or once every four to six hours is enough because that's really painful to apply a cuff and make it inflating the hand every 10 to 15 minutes. Only if the infant is unstable and you're wondering to start uh, cardiovascular medication. And then over time, you'll see interrupted blood pressure values and get just a imaginary line on top for the systolic and on the bottom for the diastolic. And you can see the trend. If the trend is consistent with phasodilatory or phasoconstrictor or very narrow pulse pressure as uh, a cardiogenic shock when you have everything low. So you can get an idea about the medication that you have to use should you go ahead and use epinephrine in cardiogenic or if this consistent phasodilatory, you just use more epinephrine or phasopressor. Um, if you don't have uh, non-invasive, sorry, invasive blood pressure, uh, if you have the ability to monitor the brain cerebral uh, oxygen saturation by nears, that's another way to get an idea about the autoregulation. Uh, we are using near fit spectroscopy as a routine for five indications. Premature infant less than 72 hours of life, less than 28 weeks, in HIE, an infant was uh, developing hydrocephalus, infant was high oxygen requirement, and infant was hemodynamic instability. So these are the five indications we are not using for everyone. Uh, we are using only for these five indications that will give us added eye, like information about the cerebral blood flow and the fluctuation of the blood pressure impact on the cerebral blood flow. So uh, I just have a query which you said that we need, to, though it's good to see the check for the trends, but if the baby is sick and we feel clinically that baby is in shock, so the baby's peripheral pulses are poor or thready and the CFT is prolonged because most of the time we use clinical parameters also. So yeah. then it's very difficult to check for, for how much time we should look for the trends before starting the inotropes or vasopressors. Yeah, it, like if you had the trend, decrease the trend, not for very long, like 30 minutes. If you okay. see the blood pressure trending down, and again, you don't have to wait until you get the blood pressure below normal value or below the percentile. If you see the baseline, blood pressure was as the baseline, for example, 50 milliliter mercury, and then dropped to uh, 40 or 35, which could be still above the percentile, but that's a significant drop of the trend, then you should consider treatment. That's 20% drop for more than 30 minutes. So you don't have to wait until you get the infant totally compromised. So that's significant 30 minutes is enough to see significant trending for more than 20%. We apply that for the blood pressure and also for near face spectroscopy. Uh, if you are lying on you said maybe perfusion, but maybe you meant the capillary refill time which is not very sensitive um, like to assess the perfusion because again, that's just the perfusion, peripheral perfusion. It's the same like perfusion index. Blood pressure is more central. Like there is no any substitute um, uh, parameter to assess the central perfusion other than the blood pressure. Plus minus the cerebral perfusion by nears, plus minus echo if, in, if indicated. Thank you so much. So I request now my co-moderator to further carry this session forward. Yeah, but uh, but again, uh, yeah, if we need to talk more detail, uh, more about the shock and management of shock and the trends of treating shock and weaning medications, you need another dedicated presentation for that. Um, so Dr. Karthik, can you please carry it forward? Thank you, Dr. Mumta. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, the Professor Yasir. Your lecture was very concise, and I especially like the single slide in which you had all the physiology problem and which inotrope to give. It was a beautifully summarized slide. Uh, to carry on with the questions, a lot of uh, participants today and many questions also. Dr. Khalid wants to ask, when do you start inotropes? I would assume that he means which are the BP cutoff or what are the 
what are the clinical uh, findings on which you would start inotropes? Yeah. So I, uh, that, that's again, a question might need a separate presentation on shock, but I will summarize. And as you mentioned, um, uh, typically in, in the slide, the memory slide, which summarizes which inotrope can be considered for which type of uh, uh, phenotype of, of abnormal blood pressure. And we divide that into three main phenotypes. So uh, again, uh, the inotropes is many categories. This is not just one category. We are talking about this category of phasopressors. And phasopressor, either norepinephrine or phasopressin, this is dedicated to vasodilatory shock. Uh, not all of them are the same. If we are talking about, there is a category which is mixed between phasopressor and inotrope, which is dopamine and epinephrine. The, uh, both medications can work as phasopressor and inotropic at the same time. We are not using dopamine for many reasons, as I mentioned. And we are using instead epinephrine if you have issue with both uh, phasoplegia or phasoelectric shock, and also the heart is not contracting well, which is late cardiogenic shock. And then the third category, which is uh, inotrope with phasoelectric action, which is dobutamine or uh, merinone. Merinone is a medication with significant phasoelectric uh, action. We are actually using this medication guided by ECHO because it's long half-life. The half-life is around four to six hours. And if you start the medication and you want to stop it, you will get still low blood pressure for many hours. So we are using this medication guided by someone expert in echo, either hemodynamic expert or cardiologist. And you can use instead dobutamine, which might give you the same action or almost the same. Uh, the extra effect of merinone, it is uh, leucotropic, which expected to uh, improve the diastolic relaxation of the heart as well. Um, so you have to select the medication based on the type of shock. So if you have the blood pressure drop below the fifth centile with normal pulse pressure, just to make it easy and simple, you have the blood pressure dropped, but pulse pressure is normal, then use phasopressor. So I can tell you that 80% of the cases that require medication to support blood pressure, they require phasopressor, not any troop. I mean, phasopressin or norepinephrine, 80% based on our data that um, partially published before and was still publishing, 80% of them, and or even 80 plus. Less than 20% of cases, uh, you may need to do an echocardiography because of expected impaired cardiac performance or phasoconstrictor shock. Then you have to select either between epinephrine or dobutamine. Uh, in this case, you will see narrow pulse pressure or all of the blood, blood, uh, blood pressure parameters are low, including narrow pulse pressure. If you have, you are, if you are not sure, epinephrine might be a medication to cover everything. If you see that the diastolic blood pressure is not very low, then you can use dobutamine. Because once you escalate dobutamine, you might get the blood pressure dropped. So it's better to start the dobutamine when you have the diastolic blood pressure at least not very low. So again, look at the table. Uh, the tables are already published, already online, and I, I think I have in a lot of websites. If you just Google the table, you'll get them. Uh, and the app is available. You have all of these entire values available on our website, newbeats.academy. Just enter the blood pressure, and the, the table, the system, or the in, artificial intelligence will let you know if the blood pressure below the centile values or not. That's an easy way. And again, I just, as I mentioned, there is very simple to select the medication. Keep in mind the category is phasopressor versus inotrope. Phasopressor, when you have normal pulse pressure, that's 80% of the cases. Inotrope, when you have normal pulse pressure or cardiogenic shock or uh, confirmed in bird myocardial performance by echo. Thank you, doctor. The next question is Dr. Atul Londe, who wants to know, does the value of pulsatility index depend on the make of the multi-para monitor? It is, does the brand of the monitor make a difference? The type of the monitor, the brand you mean? The, the company, yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, I, like I don't have to uh, mention companies by name, but I think there is a very well-known two or three companies that they are very dedicated in, in, uh, in pulse oximetry. And usually it is integrated with pulse oximetry. So that if you are using a separate pulse oximetry machine, it should be on that machine, or you may have it pulse oximetry integrated with a cardiovascular monitor like an hour unit. 
Um, so there is two or three companies they are very well known, uh, like to uh, use uh, the pulse oximetry, and you can actually go to the uh, one of the uh, auction trials. So we have the Canadian auction trial and uh, the other uh, support trial or other trials, you use the machine. So these are the machines that are really reliable to, I don't have like, because of conflict, I don't have, I should not mention the machine by brand. Uh, but all of the, like these machines, like used in these trials are really reliable uh, to be used as pulse oximetry. And for sure, they are also reliable for, uh, for uh, to use as perfusion index. And I think you meant perfusion index. Yes, oh, sorry, Perf perfusion index. Uh, the next question is from doc Dr. Bharat Vakaria. He says to thank you for your sharing your views on pulse pressures and diastolic BP. Now, if the baby is passing good volume of urine and has a normal CRT, should we still bother to consider anti-hypotensive measures? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Mm -hmm. uh, again, uh, uh, that's very important to agree, to agree between multiple variables. One blood pressure parameter separated does not doesn't mean anything. It could be low and that could be acceptable for that infant. So if you have the, uh, because the number also might be subjected to um, artifacts or uh, error in measurement, especially if you are using cuff measurement, that's why you need to do a trend over time. And you need to do from multiple sites. You may need to do for the outer limb or lower limb and to compare. You may need to do four limbs. If you have arterial line that might be perfect and the most reliable, even the arterial line, you may have also technical issues. If the line is partially blocked, or you don't have good waves, uh, that's why blood pressure alone, uh, if you have everything else normal, including perfusion, urine output, uh, uh, and the uh, blood gases, no acidosis, so that most probably there's actually a technical error in the measuring the blood pressure. Yeah, sorry, uh, I think you're muted. Uh... So you're more muted. The next question is from Dr. Bharat Srivastava. He asking whether the no, the most common underlying reason for wide pulse pressure in early neonatal period is a wide open PDA rather than vasodilatory shock. So he wants yeah. to know, is this true or false? Yes. <laughs> okay. That, yeah, that's a very uh, good question. So um, they are totally different. If I'm talking about uh, vasodilatory shock, usually the pulse pressure is not wide it is normal or slightly wide because you may have hyperdynamic circulation but you will see that the trend over time so you see the trend is decreasing and the pulse pressure is almost the same in pda because the pda is, is not open in, in just one minute it's open for some time you will see the wide pulse pressure but the plateau is uh, the, the blood pressure is plateau is not really trending down significantly and you will see that the solid blood pressure is expected to be low in significant BDA, but wide pulse pressure was normal systolic pressure. In, in case of phasodilatory shock, you see systolic and diastolic both are low, but with maintained pulse pressure. So that's the main difference. So there's two main differences. The trend is decreasing significantly over a short period of time in phasodilatory shock, and the pulse pressure uh, is normal or slightly above normal, with low systolic blood pressure. In PDA, you have high systolic and really significant, yeah, like why it is really wide. And it is plateau, not trending down. And for sure, you have to investigate the PDA is confirmed by echo and the infant not behaving like septic. So there is no explanation to be phasodilatory unless you have in rare situation, septic shock associated with PDA because the sepsis might really open the duct. That's another thing that to keep in mind. So you may have both conditions at the same time, which we call it overlap physiology. So there is a, another type of physiology. I mentioned only three types. There is a, the shunt physiology, and there is hypovolemia physiology. I mentioned only three times because, as I mentioned, you need a dedicated, separate presentation to discuss the all the uh, the entire uh, phenotypes, all of the phenotypes of shock, including the shunt physiology and hypovolemia. Um, and restrictive physiology, there are so many other types. In shunt physiology, uh, you may have also septic shock on top of that because the PDA might reopen because of the septic shock. 
and that will be based on the clinical circumstances and also confirmation by echo. Dr. Vikas Agarwal thanks you for the wonderful presentation. He asks, are the BP values mentioned in your presentation based on non-invasive BP, that is cuff BP, or in that case, how does that correlate with the arterial BP? Your presentation is based on invasive or non-invasive? Yeah, so, um, present my presentation overall, I, I mentioned both, but the study that we did in our unit during the postnatal transition on normative value based on invasive only. So only invasive blood pressure, we excluded any infant without uh, arterial line inserted umbilical line. But there is another study that I recommend to follow and we uh, extracted some tables also available on our website, which is a uh, Zobro, a study that was done in California, 1996. I, I just, I have that in one of the slides and I, I showed the table that we are using and including the pulse pressure. So that study was based on non-invasive. So regardless, it's no problem. If you have none, you are relying on non-invasive, you can use a zoprotic uh, study, which we have the tables available also in our unit and we are using that uh, until the corrected uh, age of term. So they started from preterm 23 week every week until corrected age of term. Or if you, if you have invasive uh, method, you can rely on our study, published study. So, and I showed both in, our, in, uh, in the presentation. But my present my study and normative data that published in rehabilitative research was based on invasive blood pressure. Uh, Dr. Khalid has a question. How do you titrate inotropes? So when we're saying inotropes, I mean inotropes or vasopressors. How to titrate these drugs? Can you do it? Should you do it slowly or can you stop abruptly once a BP is maintained? Very good question. Um this also might need a separate presentation, which is titled as uh, the titration of cardiovascular medication. Uh, unfortunately, there is not a lot of publications uh, talking about the titration there, considering when to start and what medication to start. But they did not talk about the, the, uh, the appropriate titration, which is also very important to know. So it is based on the half-life of the medication. So if you are using catecholamines, half life is very short, few minutes. So you can, you can titrate quickly. And how quickly it's guided by the blood pressure. So we can titrate every 15 to 60 minutes by uh, one to two phasoactive inotropic score, which means that if you are using dobutamine, so it is titration by uh, one to two mics per kg per minute every 15 to 60 minutes based on the blood pressure. So you decrease by one step and look at the blood pressure maintained for 15 to 20, 60 minutes, and then win again. Like 15 minutes, if you have the blood pressure, the blood pressure normalized very quickly and the infant stabilized. If the infant took long time to be stabilized, you need more time to wait to be sure that the blood pressure maintained. And for the vitamin per se, I usually consider at least uh, 30 minutes to one hour and not even if 15 minutes might be enough. Because the half-life, again, is uh, talking about uh, two to five minutes half-life. So once you drop the medication, you should see the effect quickly. Uh, and do that guided by the blood pressure. As long as the blood pressure just lie that in the chart to the bedside nurse, that wean the blood pressure every 15 minutes. You can make it, if, if the infant is not very stable, uh, up to one hour is not a problem. If the blood pressure above that value and consider the value is the 25th centile for that gestational age as a cut limit value. If the blood pressure maintained above that value, continue weaning. If you are using merinone, it is long half-life. Then you have to wean slower. So we are talking about a, a four to six hours interval. So we usually start at 0 0.3 maximum. Uh, up to 0 0.9 mics per kg per minute of merinone, win by 0.1 to 0.2 maximum every four to six hours. And that because of the half-life is long. If you are using phasopressin, the half-life is around uh, one hour. So we need every two hours. Win by uh, if you are using uh, milli unit, it is we are starting at 0 0.3 milli unit per kg uh, per minute, 
then you can in, uh, win by 0 0.1 million at every uh, two hours, as long as the blood pressure maintained. Uh, and if you are using hydrocortisone on top of that, keep the hydrocortisone, the last medication to wean, and wean it on daily basis. So for example, if the infant is getting the hydrocortisone Q6 hours, wean one day Q8 hours, sec and keep it until next day, wean it every uh, to be Q12, and the next day to be off. So we need it on daily basis, not very quickly, because hydrocortisone has longer half-life, and a lot of them, a lot of premature babies, they have impaired suprarenal function. So you need to monitor that. And they might need to be in hydrocortisone for a longer period of time. Uh, the next question is by Dr. Vikas Agarwal. If you start dobutamine for preterm babies with shock, how yeah. do you titrate the dose as... The dobutamine improves organ function, but the effect on BP itself may be not directly correlated with the improvement in organ perfusion. Okay, wonderful. Very good question. So we are using dobutamine if you have uh, at least normal or close to normal diastolic blood pressure. Don't use dopamine when you have very low diastolic blood pressure. Otherwise, as you said, uh, the blood pressure might drop even further. Um, so... Uh, otherwise, you use uh, not, uh, you use epinephrine, not dobutamine. So, if you have low diastolic blood pressure with normal pulse pressure and low systolic, use epinephrine instead. If you have almost close to normal diastolic, but normal pulse pressure and low systolic, use uh, then use dobutamine. And uh, if you are increasing, and then later on the blood pressure dropped, no problem. You can add uh, nor epinephrine. Uh, the second medication, or you can replace the dobutamine with epinephrine. That's another option. Uh, once you get the blood pressure stabilized for six to eight hours, then you can start weaning. And again, how frequent, uh, like uh, how frequent you can wean? As I mentioned, in dobutamine, I wean every thirty minutes to one hour by uh, zero. Uh, sorry, by one uh, mic per kg per uh, per minute. So if the infant on ten mics. We in from uh, 10 to 9 and then 8. Once you reach uh, 5 mics, then you can win uh, completely. You can discontinue, I mean. The next question again by Dr. Bharat Vakaria. How well does intra-arterial continuous BP correlate with blood pressure BP? Yeah, it is based on the... Um, if you are using if you are using the perfect method, the right size, the right size of the cuff, covering two thirds of the arm and not very tight and not very loose, it is already the perfect. It is in literature uh, correlating mainly with the diastolic and mean blood pressure more than systolic and pulse pressure. So the systolic and pulse pressure is more accurate on the invasive, but uh, in the diastolic and mean you may get that almost almost comparable to the invasive if you if you are using the right technique and the right size of the cuff and again you have to measure it multiple times so at least three times three measurement don't just rely on one measurement uh, three measurements at least or more if you continue every 15 minutes if the infant is unstable i think uh, uh, next few questions are repetitions uh, because uh, Dr. Manav says that what does an IVP correlate with the clinical parameters, which you have already answered, CRT and other things. Then uh, how to be in inotropes already, you said. So now uh, Jaya P is asking, uh, she said it's, it's an excellent talk. And uh, what are the recommended starting dose for various inotropes? I think they, that also you have answered. So the does severity of sh shock plays a role in deciding the same? When to we add vasopressin to the management. So uh, I think it's a separate talk you required for the inotropes and the vasopressors and the, so many queries are coming. Uh, Dr. Manoj want to say something. Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, Dr. Mabda. I just wanted to ask Professor yeah, sir, it's such an uh, amazing talk and elaborate discussion. Do you have more time, the, all the time that you have... Uh, Mention we will sp you will spend with us all the time is over. Do we have another five more minutes to wind up? No problem. It was pleasure. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Please go ahead, Dr. Mamta. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
So uh, the Bharat again is asking that do you suggest adding a new drug to manage hypotension or do you change to a new one and discontinue the previous if the response is not seen in 30 to 45 minutes? Okay, that, that's very good question. Wonderful question. Because one, I, one of the main issues, um, again, if you have in the future a chance to discuss the sh shock in more details, one of the main issues that uh, we may encounter when you add medications over medication, you may get more side effects, not improvement. Especially if you add so uh, many any troops to high dose, you may get impaired uh, myocardial uh, relaxation or diastolic functions. So when you when you use any troops, any troops might improve the systolic performance on expense of diastolic relaxation. So at the end. Uh, just to make it easy to uh, imagine, if you give too much, for example, dopamine of 20, added of dopamine of 20, epinephrine of 1. I have seen maybe one patient like that. When you assess by echo, the heart was empty and the heart was contracting like convulsing. So the heart is very stiff, does not relax. So the heart cannot relax to accept the venous return. Heart was very con like uh, almost uh, at one stage of um, of systolic contraction and almost empty uh, and systole and the infant was almost dying. So what we did in, at that time, just we discontinued all of the inner troops and then was, and we gave flows and infant improved. That's one of the cases that I remember for many, so many years now, I'm using the same case for, to teach the side effects of using so many troops with high dose. So uh, if you start one medication and there is no improvement or worsening, it means that you are not in the right direction. So you can easily replace it. And uh, uh, if you are using catecholamines, means the half-life is very short. If you stop it and use another medication, the interval is very short. The other medication will work within five minutes. If you are worried, you can give overlap of 15 minutes. That's not a problem. Start another medication and overlap 15 minutes and stop. Uh, then stop the first one. But, but don't keep all of the medications and keep adding one over one over one. At the end, you will get the infant deteriorated, not because of shock, because of the impact of adding so dangerous medications. Uh, and again, don't worry, the medication is very short half life. If you need to reuse it, like restart again, you can start and you'll get the effect within minutes. Uh, so 15 minutes overlap is enough. For example, if you started to be timing and blood pressure drop, and now you are thinking I should start on norepinephrine because of the low blood, very low blood pressure, that's okay. Start on norepinephrine in 15 minutes, stop the dobitamine. And that like as easy as that, but don't keep both medications. The only case that we keep two medications if we need really both medications. For example, if you have LV or RV dysfunction and we need merinone or dobitamine, but the infant develop low blood pressure because of merinone is high dose, which is still needed for RV dysfunction. We add norepinephrine to support the systolic uh, systemic blood pressure and to maintain the blood pressure uh, at reasonable level. Uh, then we add the medication for a reason, but not just adding medication because the other one is not working well and uh, we keep both. Right. That's great. So uh, I'll take few questions, few important, uh, good, interesting. So is there any role of close monitoring of calcium and sodium in the management of hy hypertension? Uh, is there any role of what, sorry? The calcium, calcium and block? sodium in the management of hypertension. Is there any role or how, how do you monitor them? Yeah, that's very important, uh, very important question. So typically in sick infants, we, we monitor calcium, phosphorus, and sodium, potassium in daily basis. And easy to get that also in the blood gases. If in some units you have the, in the blood gases, at the same time you have the electrolytes and the hemoglobin. If you have this ability, that's wonderful. And it, again, it's very important because of, if you are using medication like phosphopressin, it might induce hyponatremia. And uh, you may need to get the sodium at least above 130 to get the hemodynamics improved. Uh, so it is very important to get the electrolytes and more importantly to get the pH at least above 7.2 if you are using catecholamines. Uh, in some situations, if we are unable to control acidosis and uh, um, the catecholamines are not very effective, we are using phosopressin, which is not very uh, pH dependent and very low blood pressure. But it's important to maintain the pH above 7.2 
sodium at least above 130, for sure potassium, calcium should be normalized. Okay. So, uh, uh, so sildenafil and congenital diaphragmatic hernia, I think it's, I think it's the separate uh, the class you need for this, separate lecture you need. I think we'll go with the, some related questions as uh, like uh, the Khalid is, Jennifer is asking that what is your view of getting cortisol level before starting steroids? So do you need to do the cortisol, serum cortisol levels? Yeah. So uh, we, we do that as a routine. And if the we are relying on 350, if the number is 350, for sure we will continue. But uh, there is a lot of limitations of that because it's random uh, cortisol level. So it is really helpful if the number is low. If the number is low, it means that we have to continue with hydrocortisone. But we don't have to wait to give the loading dose until you get the results back. Right. So send the level, that we usually we do that. Send the level, and then the level might come after two or three hours and give the hydrocortisone loading dose, which is not very harmful, even if you give it with high cortisol level. If the level is high, this does not rule out superenal dysfunction because it could be high now, and if you test it two hours later, then it might be low. So sometimes even we'll continue with hydrocortisone when the cortisol level is a little bit high, when there is severe shock. But if the level is low, definitely, uh, it is unlikely to be false negative or false low. But you may have false high uh, results. So it is helpful when it is low, but we do it as a routine. So the another question by Dr. Lal is that, can a normal slime bolus be the first option in a new unit with clinical shock? I think, yes. of course, yeah, that's... True. If you are not sure, I will uh, give you two categories. If the infant was not normal pulse pressure, normal pulse pressure, and pure phasodilatory shock with no impression of third space losses, then you may give just phasopressor. Uh, but if the infant was normal pulse pressure and you don't have echo, the normal pulse pressure could be due to low stroke volume or underfilling of the heart. If you are not sure, at least before you start to do vitamin or um, uh, inotrope, prime the heart or the circulation with at least 10 cc VKG of normal saline bolus, because you are not sure. Only if you did an echocardiography and the echo showed very good filling of the heart, there is no issue with the volume, there is no third space losses, and you are not worried about the volume depletion, then it is not man like uh, mandatory or part of the management plan. If you are not sure, you can give 10 to 20 cc, and but don't keep giving the boluses without uh, right. understanding is it really helpful or not. And it's easy to watch the blood pressure. If you give the bolus and you see the blood pressure immediately improved, that means that the infant's responsive, volume responsive. It means that the infant's really volume depleted. Here you see the normal, the, the urine output improved. So the JIP is asking, which is I think very relevant sometimes we feel that many times neonate become irritable and cry vigorously when the BP cup, cuff inflates during non-invasive monitoring. How much error in BP measurement can we expect because of this? Yeah, that's a very good question. So if the infant is really sick or unstable, um, sometimes you are using a medication like uh, we have to respect pain for neonates. So we're using uh, uh, morphine or fentanyl, uh, either infusion or as uh, PRN doses to settle the infant who's really in pain. We should not measure the blood pressure when the infant is like in pain or very irritable. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you are considering uh, an error issue with the non-invasive blood pressure, Multiple measurements, at least the three measurements, and follow the trend might uh, give you a, an idea about if the initial measurement was really high because of irritation or so, or and now normalized or false high. So uh, respect the pain of the patient is really in pain and don't measure the blood pressure when the infant is really agitated or not really uh, re re relaxed well. And the multiple measurement over time is very important. Uh, and you can use different limbs, not only one limb. Yes, thank you. So the uh, next question is, what will you do in PDA physiology of hypotension? And is this indication to treat, especially with impaired urine output? 
and what you will do if the infant is two weeks old with PDF physiology of hypertension? Yeah, that's a very good question. So usually the PDA in most of the premature babies, it is uh, causing pulmonary overcirculation. And uh, a very small number of them, it might affect the systemic perfusion, uh, especially beyond the postnatal transition period. So usually we see increased oxygen requirement, increased ventilatory support, but in a rare situation, you may see a low diastolic blood pressure with a hypo uh, perfusion of the systemic circulation and especially kidney. Uh, if you do echo by yourself, that's really helpful because you may also do the renal artery Doppler. Uh, so if you see the PDA is significant and you see there is a reverse diastolic flow mm -hmm. in the renal artery, associated with decreased urine output, that's definitely related to the PDA. Then you should treat the PDA. Um, keep in mind that might be aggravated with two things. This PDA shunt physiology is expected to be uh, aggravated uh, on premature, in premature babies due to two things. Suprarenal dysfunction, which is in a lot of situation not really looked at properly, and in, the infant is developing sepsis. So, for example, if the infant was PDA for two weeks now, even if it's significant, not closed, but suddenly the urine output dropped. So why it is really dropped now? The infant has been stable for two weeks. So that's something wrong going on. The most two things to keep in mind, either developing a new sepsis or new inflammation or new neck, which might also uh, uh, increase the shunt through the PDA because of the dropped systemic vascular resistance, or it could be uh, suprarenal dysfunction, uh, which your simply you may investigate by sending cortisol level. And a, a lot of cases we have seen that a failure of non steroidal anti inflammatory was big shunt, and the infant re responded to uh, uh, steroids because of suprarenal dysfunction. But in, in this case, if the baby is having sepsis, or uh, because blood culture will take at least 24 to 48 hours to come. And if we give a steroid, does it have some harmful effect on the baby? Yeah, like, no, I'm, yeah I'm talking about two different situations. Yeah. Either, uh, either infection might be contributing, which you, you for sure you have to send the blood cultures and yeah. start antibiotics. Uh, steroids only if superlinal dysfunction, which might not be associated with infection, but if the septic shock associated, uh, sorry, if the infection associated with septic shock, you may use hydrocortisone to treat shock, not to treat the PDA with assumed function with infection. Mm -hmm. So that's two separate uh, uh, situations. Only if infection associated with septic shock and you already used norepinephrine or phosphopressor and the blood pressure is still low and now you are really worried about worsening of shock so you need to add hydrocortisone, but if you already started on antibiotics, no problem. Mm -hmm. If you already started on antibiotics, you're already infant covered those antibiotics, broad spectrum antibiotics, that should be fine if you're already treating bad septic shock. Okay. So the one last interesting question, because there are too many, but you have already answered it them in between. So the is blood pressure chart suitable for IUGR? Uh, IUGR yeah. babies. Yeah, that, that's a very interesting question. When we use the centile values, uh, we did not actually uh, 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 correct for IUGR because the population is not very high. So that you need huge sample value <laughs> to do that and so many years. So like you can imagine we stayed five years to in the normalized value and we excluded so many of them because of uh, 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 because e either they are unstable or received medications or whatever. So that was very tough to exclude also IUGR uh, or to correct for IUGR to get a centile values for them. You need really huge sample size. But what I can say that in, usually in IUGR, um, they may have uh, 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 very premature babies, they may have uh, issue with heart performance during the postnatal transition. For example, when you have the placenta with very high resistance and the heart is very premature, the infant born, we have seen that in few cases in very significant cardiogenic shock 
or vasoconstrictive physiology in second or third day of life. And you will see the pulse pressure narrow for them. We just follow the normative, the same normative value. You don't have to follow any specific, but the echocardiography should be very helpful to diagnose impaired myocardial performance for them. So just imagine that the heart was contracting against the high resistance before birth for a long time, and the infant just born was high, that high resistance. Premature heart may not be able to uh, co keep contracting after birth against that high resistance and might fail in one to two days. Term babies, usually term IUGR babies, we will, they will usually they compensate for that without any issue. So we see them issues, but that's not very common. We see every year, maybe two or three cases, uh, preterm IUGR, and they may have severe postnatal cardiovascular, uh, compromised cardi cardiovascular circulation. And uh, it is very clear on echo, you see the heart performance very poor. And you need to start the vitamin or marinone for them. I think it's an excellent talk with excellent discussion, Professor Yasser. And okay. I feel I feel that we should have much more time for you, like really want to interact you much more before. So I hope Dr. Manoj will again call you for the next session. That calls for time. another session. Yes. And probably, you know, like because uh, I mean, I, I, we are tr truly today enjoying the fruits of tiring, challenging research. Uh, that has been carried out and then he has made it so beautiful in a concise presentation. But again, imagine the uh, kind of challenge that it must have possible, you know, getting these, uh, this is some, uh, venturing into a novel territory, even though we consider it as, uh, I mean, like something that we take it for granted. And so, like, definitely, we would love to have you, Professor Yasser, uh, for more interactions in the coming days. We will definitely keep in touch with you. Uh, sure. Yeah, communicate with me at any time, even like outside formal presentations uh, with pleasure. And uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, platform, other platforms and uh, uh, probably will share with you our uh, webinars as well. So you can maybe uh, share your uh, announcement of your webinars and also share from ours in Canada. So a lot of uh, future presentation might be focusing on related topics uh, related, uh, related to not only the blood pressure or hypotension or shock, related to management of uh, uh, sick infants in general, pulmonary hypertension, um, chronic lung disease, ventilation, related issues. We have a lot of, we have a lot of uh, uh, things on our uh, platform, New Beats Academy. And uh, probably I'll connect you with our uh, team and uh, you can uh, kindly share our, uh, our future webinars. And uh, we're looking forward to like do more collaborations and more webinars in the future. We will definitely love to do that actually, because we believe the very fact that this uh, whole series has been uh, on the principle of knowledge sharing, free knowledge sharing, knowledge is for sharing. And uh, that is the thing. So we would definitely love to uh, do that and interact with you in the course of future. Now, if it is okay with uh, both the moderators, can we wind up the session or like any more questions? No, thank you so much. I, I know there are there are a lot of questions I am seeing in the question answer person, but then we have uh, uh, we are so fortunate to have you uh, have our faculty for so long. It's uh, not uh, advisable to not to stick to time when we say time. So probably we will wind up here before. We close the session. We have the Secretary General of National Neonatology Forum India, Dr. Surendra Bisht. I would request him to speak a few words, then we will conclude. Over to you, Dr. Surendra. Uh, thank you, Manoj. And I'm so glad even in the last month and the last tag end of the year, we are able to do one more uh, next webinar. And uh, I'm really grateful to Manoj uh, for having done so. Uh, on behalf of uh, National Neonatology Forum, Professor Yasser, I extend my gratitude and uh, thanks to you for having conducted such a wonderful uh, session. And uh, uh, the kind of, in fact, you rightly said, the it was about blood pressure of babies, which you, it was so difficult to measure because you, the inclusion criteria was so strict. Almost yeah. nine or 10 inclusion criteria, I, I felt you would not get any preterm of that kind uh, in any of the NICUs. That is the why you just had one tertiary center measuring it for five years or so. And then also somebody asking for IUGR was such a big 
uh, questions for things. A great, great job there. And uh, I think all the participants, uh, we we struggle with our anotrop with the present that is what the question for we went from blood pressure and mean blood pressure to anotrop and vasopressin, but you have answered all. Thank you, Dr. Mamta and Karthik. And uh, Manoj, that's a great. And uh, we are looking forward for next year's next webinars with that kind of a spirit and enthusiasm. And we really want to take it uh, some uh, some steps higher, uh, obviously, certainly. Thank you. Thank you, Thank everyone. You, uh, Thank you for wonderful moderations. And I really enjoyed every moment and all of the questions from everyone. It's a great pleasure and a, um, a wish of uh, the time can fit for, to answer all of the questions and enjoy all of the discussion. But uh, in the future, hopefully, we can have a, another uh, maybe chance or um, another opportunity to go over more uh, details about shock and how to manage sick uh, new needs. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Yasser, once again. Uh, I would also like to thank the moderators for today, mm -hmm. and, uh, Dr. Mamta Jaju and uh, Dr. Brigadier Kartik Ramohan uh, for moderating the session the, uh, so very well. And, uh, and last but not the least, thank you all of you, all the respected attendees who have been with us for the last now uh, three and a half, nearing four years since uh, Jan June 2020. It is a, uh, a huge uh, journey of uh, learning, uh, unlearning and learning that we had in these days. So please do continue to join us in the next sessions as well. Uh, so this is, a, as we mentioned previously, this is the last session of this year. Next year, uh, because of the na National Congress of the uh, Indian Academy of Pediatrics, we won't have a session in January. So in February, 1st of February, we will have um, the first uh, session of 2024. That's on BPD. Uh, and then from then onwards, uh, we, we will continue. So the uh, all the details uh, will be shared to you uh, individually. Uh, with these words, uh, with all your permission, we will uh, wind up for today. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye. It's a honor.